So your Coca-Cola in 1933, your drink has taken off across the world. The Great Depression has been the greatest thing ever. Coca-Cola sales have 10 x in growth with absolutely no signs of slowing down. Coca-Cola has been expanding globally and rapidly becoming the most popular soft drink in all of Europe. But things are starting to turn south. Europe is fastly approaching a super mega crazy big war that makes everyone in the West nervous. If America decides to enter the war against Germany, this will mean the certain death for Coca-Cola in Europe. It's war in Europe and the Allies are shitting themselves. And just as Coca-Cola feared, America joined in 1941 and everyone's ass is being kicked by Hitler. And no one more so than the head of Coca-Cola for Germany, Max Keith. When Germany declared war on America, they retaliated by slapping a huge trade embargo on Nazi Germany, meaning suddenly that nobody could sell, buy, or send anything to or from Nazi Germany. This also meant that Coca-Cola couldn't send their stock to Germany to be sold. As a result, sales in Europe absolutely plummeted, and things were about to get much worse. As total war was declared, the Nazi party started to seize non-approved foreign businesses operating in Germany. And this of course meant that the American Coca-Cola company could be seized and being stripped of millions of dollars worth of assets including factories and stock all across Europe. And as a result the company had to make a full withdrawal from Germany and all of its occupied territories which was basically all of Europe. They had to come up with a different plan in order to keep sales high in Europe. It's a massive market they couldn't just let go to waste at the site of a trade embargo. And luckily some prior planning they had came to help. The American Coca-Cola company had established a sister organization specifically for marketing Coca-Cola to the German market a decade prior, headed by, you guessed it, Max Keith. This company was solely dedicated to the Coca-Cola operations in Germany, and in order for Max Keith to uh, keep his job, he had to get the Coca-Cola German operation back up and running. But he needed something new for the German wartime market that was exclusively German. He wasn't allowed to sell any foreign products, it had to be 100% German made. So Keith got to work in his lab, taking the only ingredients that were available in Germany at the time. Sugar beets, whey, and apple pomance. If you're wondering what that is, well, it's what later Kais described as the leftovers of leftovers. But the Germans loved it. They were bending head over heels for this sugarized compost drink. Sugar was such a rarity in Nazi Germany that basically anything that was sweet, people absolutely died for. And when it finally came time to name the beverage, they collectively decided on the name Fanta. And it stuck. Kais loved the name, and that was what was going on the product. Fanta suddenly became an overnight success. The German wing of Coca-Cola used their plants in the Netherlands and the German homelands that were cut off from the parent company to mass produce this new 100% German product. Basically since the war started, everyday working Germans who weren't on the front line were starved on any sort of luxury. And most people sadly went hungry for long periods of time. Anything with any flavour became sought after and this is what Fanta capitalised on. The beverage was actually so sweet that it was used more as a cooking ingredient to sweeten dull food as sugar was severely rapid and extremely hard to come by. And to make matters even better for Fanta, there weren't really any other soft drinks in Nazi Germany at the time. So if you wanted something other than water, Fanta was kind of your only option. When Fanta really became mainstream, Nazi Germany still had a huge hold on lots of territory all across Europe. The potential customer base pretty much consisted of all of the population of mainland Europe, which Nazi Germany controlled at the time. And being the only soft drink beverage widely available at the time meant that their sales skyrocketed. And in order to be able to serve all of these these territories, Keith used his connections from within the Third Reich. After pulling a few strings, he was officially appointed as the head of all soft drink plants in Germany and occupied territories, giving him the rights to use overtaken factories in Italy, France, Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Norway to start mass producing the Fanta that everyone came to love. As a result, Fanta spread all over Europe and it was a major success. And all of this time, it was totally isolated from its parent American company. They had lost all communication with the American company and were going fully on their own. Own steam. And amazingly, in such a short period of time, it became as popular as Coke had been before the war. German Coca-Cola sold around 4.5 million cases of Fanta in just a few years, and as a result, Keith made massive profit. But it just wasn't to last. Once the Allies started to march on German conquered lands and Germany proper, it was also the end of Fanta. It was after all a rogue project created in desperate circumstance to combat lost profits and lost sales. Once all was said and done, Max Keith handed over the keys back to the German factories and also all the profits of the Fanta operation back to Robert Woodruff, the president of Coca-Cola. Woodruff reinstated Keith in the Coca-Cola company after the two years he'd been cut off connection during the war. Keith got made chief of all of Europe for Coca-Cola for his loyalty and refusal 
refusal to join the Nazi party despite numerous high-level offerings. But because of his close affiliation to the Nazis during the war, he was given the name Superfuhrer by some of the German factory owners. After the war, Fanta was discontinued in Europe. Coca-Cola didn't want to rival the strength of their main product, and Fanta for the time lay dormant. Until the bastards at Pepsi next door started to release multiple different drink flavours to try to trump over Coke. And after a few years, in 1955, the Coca-Cola execs gave in and wanted a new product to win over more consumers. The German execs looked over and Fanta was brought out the cupboard. This new version of Fanta was created in post-war Italy using local oranges from there. It was given a more fruity and less ginger beer feel, thus adopting its more signature orange colour and fun branding for a less conservative and more liberal post-war audience. And it was a massive success across the Mediterranean. People absolutely loved it. However, Fanta was still kept under locks on reaching the American market until the early 60s due to reoccurring fears of it harming the flagship Coca-Cola product. At this point, an American icon and something they did not want to risk losing. But by 1969, it was the best-selling flavour on the planet. In the years since, Fanta has emerged into a fun, bright and colourful brand, big on energising its consumers. In the modern day, Fanta sales remain steady. It's one of the most popular beverages all across the world and has slightly changed since its original founding in Nazi Germany. Let's just hope in World War 3 we will not have another Fanta situation. Now watch this video on how Disney could become a nuclear superpower.